exhibition, Francis Hard, The Superior Honolulu, in the galleries. Um, it'll be open today until 4. We also have a great show uh, by Cody, who's in the room. Cody Anderson, yay! Um, in our Commons Gallery, there are maps on the table. Uh, in the uh, Francis R. exhibition and how to get to that gallery space as well. That's also open until 4, so I encourage you to see it. Um, we have a lot to get through today, so without further ado, I will introduce Gay, the curator of our exhibition, who will introduce our first, uh, our first speaker, and then we'll go from there. This is Gay Chan. She curated the show. much for spending some of your um, part of your Sunday with us. It gives me such great pleasure to introduce Chris Rohr, who is one of the two people who've been, who's currently the head of Analog Sunshine Recorder. Um, Chris used to be my student. I'm just going to go ahead and falsely oh, claim great. that I'm responsible yep, for that. <laughs> And I made this late. <laughs> Out of all the slides that I used to teach with when Chris was a student. It's not even as heavy as you think it be. So um, we invited Analog Sunshine Recorder to do a project in conjunction with the Francis Parr show. So I'm going to leave Chris to explain what that is and something about the group as well. Cool. So uh, we're kind of a, we're called the Analog Sunshine Recorders, and we're a collective of photographers who kind of explore the magic of film photography and collaboration. Um, it's interesting because most of us weren't even born at the time that a lot of the cameras that we used were made. So experiment <laughs> experimenting with them is really fun to do in this uh, age of digital photography. Um, so our, our group ranges from at the most 25 people. For this project, we had uh, 10 photographers. Five are actually here hiding in the back. Like, how we used to do in school. Um, <laughs> but, um, so for this project, Gay asked us to do a little something based on the exhibition. So we decided to use the same kind of cameras that he used in the 60s and um, go and re-photograph the, the areas on that little map. So we had 10 of us, and each of us uh, had two spots. A couple of us had one spot. But, um, we kind of met at Ziffy's and divided up the spots. <laughs> and everybody kind of broke away and went to their spots. And then we met back up in a couple hours. And so these are kind of the product of our little um, hour long photo walk. And then, so everybody shot one roll and then we picked kind of the best two from each roll. And so when you're up here taking a look, it goes left to right. It's uh, 1 through 18 based on the map. If you want to see how the area looks now. Oh yeah. What camera did you use? I use I use a Rolleiflex, mm -hmm. but um, one of the other photographers was using the Mamiya C330, which is actually in the case. Mm -hmm. And we, yeah, he didn't even know that he was shooting the exact same camera that was in the case. That so was kind of cool. Wait, do you stay there? Thank you. Can you talk a little bit about? that kind of camera, the, the single lens reflex, or the, uh, the twin lens reflex, and what that does as a, as a photographer, so what kind of shooting experience? Those ones, be? you're looking down on it. So to me, it's an easier way to do street photography, because you're not staring at somebody. But it produces those 6 by 6 negatives, so a square format, which is kind of like instagram -y. So that's <laughs> what we thought was kind of interesting when we made the light box. We're like, oh, it looks like an actual Instagram in real life. Maybe we can get it vertical. Without but filters. Yeah, without filters. And, and this will be on view also in the Department of Art and Art History for two weeks after today. In the, yeah, in the window. So will you be staying through the whole thing? Because I think a bunch of people wanted to connect with you and the yeah. ASR. Yeah, there's actually a bunch of us right back there. <laughs> Can you raise, raise your, your hands? hands? Yeah. Hey. 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 Thanks for giving us the opportunity to do that. That was really fun. Okay, now we're on. Um, this is going to be a very geeky talk. This is probably the geekiest talk I have ever given because it's so, this show was kind of, I, I was given the task of being the acting gallery director before our new director showed up. So I was like just looking around for projects 
And I really love Francis Hart's film, which I hope all of you have seen and will see over and over, because I've seen it 30 times or more, and it's still <laughs> fabulous. Um, so it was really amazing to find that there are photographs of his work at the Hamilton Library. Oh, sorry. I guess I could do this, but I need to point. You can flip it on. Okay. We should have worked out all of these things yeah. before, obviously. Okay. So if you want to see more of uh, Francis Hart's work, it's on the fifth floor of the Hamilton Library. This project, um, most of the prints in the gallery were made between 63 and 64. Uh, the footage for the film was also shot in 63 and 64. It's never really been shown in a group except for this one occasion, also on UH campus in 64, in the place that used to be where the art department was in George Hall. It's, ama it's pretty amazing that, so he mounted the photographs on poster board, which is quite common in that period. And these actual poster boards are also still available in a different collection, also on the fifth floor of the Hamilton Library. So those of you who want to f go down this particular rabbit hole with me, please do that. Um, but ever since then, this group of work has not been shown together as a group. Maybe two or three photographs published or in other shows. So it's really amazing to see so much of his work in the same place. So I'm a photographer, but mostly I really love looking at other people's pictures particularly anonymous ones, stuff I find in garage sales, in the trash, in a puddle. And I look at them because I'm just staring to see who made this, who, what they were looking at. And maybe things that they didn't intend to look at, but there's a residue of what happened before anyway. Um, here's a picture of where Aala is now. It's 1883. So I'm not sure what the photographer is looking at, but the streams, the borders of the stream, there's like nothing, it's just nature. And then soon, in 89, there was already some attempt in creating, like um, controlling the path of the streams. I want you to pay attention to, this is a very low res work, I couldn't find a better one. I want you to pay along to the, this, this, the, the contour of the mountains, because they'll show up again later. And then in the 1900s, um, there's a, the famous baseball field in the Aala, the, the diamond head side of the Aala Park. But you can see there's a rock wall here. Mm -hmm. That's River Street. Mm -hmm. And you can see there's this, I think, naked boy yeah. hanging on like a monkey there, mm -hmm. while the very dressed up <laughs> people were there. So the, the little details is what I love about looking at photographs. Um, I know you're probably looking at the clothes and the building, but I want you to pay attention to the ironwood trees because that's how I know where the picture is taken because those trees are still there in Isle Park, right next to the skater park. So it's because I'm always curious when I look at a picture where it was made, and what might have been there before. And so all, of, all photographs are, um, are specifically of a split second in time. That's all. And even that split second, maybe a, fifth, a 50th of a second at the time, maybe a half a second, it doesn't capture reality. It's just that, that moment. So um, with a team of folks, from the Minatoshi Architects, I tried to figure out where Francis Hart's pictures were taken. So those of you who've been to the show might have seen some of the, um, the 18 photographs that we were able to find the exact location and then pair them up with what Google, how Google Maps shows it today. Now, so how do we figure out what's where? Again, it's information that maybe the photographer didn't really care about is incidental, like that hole, the drainage in the river street. 
There was a guy who, who lived on Mauna Kea in this, in this area who was fighting with me. He says, no, this is not on Mauna Kea. And I'm like, okay, so pay attention to right there. Yes, it's right there. This, don't fight with me about this. Because <laughs> look at the font of the 19. So that's a Sumida building. And then this one, um, on the left, the angle is so unique. Like there were no drones back then and there was, so how could Francis Har have gotten that angle? So he must have climbed up on the temple that they have moved to the opposite side of the river street. So these are little details that are so marvelous. So I was looking for this building because all of these were torn down. My, my pointer sucks here. So I went, made me very dizzy to try and figure out which way it was facing. So I have a different angle. So I spent a lot of time counting windows. <laughs> And look, that, that pipe, it's still there. Except that now they have a rain guard on top of it. So there's one big regret um, that I did not include this image in the show. I didn't know enough when I made those decisions. The reason why I regret it is because this is a place that the film was conceived. Uh, one of the collaborators of the film is Kenneth Bushnell, who was a former co colleague of mine. He taught painting there, and he had um, a studio in this building above the uh, Ala Pawn Shop. And a friend of him told him that that whole area was going to be demolished. So he and Francis and another guy, Steve Bartlett, decided to make the film that is screening. <laughs> this. <laughs> <laughs> It's called Palama Junction, the, the uh, Ala Pawn Shop building. You know, at one time, was the most dangerous corner in Honolulu. And where it is, is at the very tip of uh, Ala Park. So on the third floor of the um, building, I want you to pay attention to that arch, because in the film, was this, um, this shot that must have been made on the opposite side of the building facing the mountains. It's 18.11 in. <laughs> and I want you to compare. So it's really unbelievable to me that there was nothing on the other side. So we're looking into, I guess that must be New Anu Valley. So um, Har made a number of photographs of the uh, Ala Pawn shop. This is a different shot. It's made with a 4x5 camera. Um, his Documents of Honolulu, of disappearing Honolulu, actually was beyond the Aala area. Um, the earliest, the earlier work was primarily of four by f with four by five cameras, and it was usually of buildings and locations, and not so much of people. In 63, 64, he started to use uh, two and a quarter, which is what Chris was talking about, and so all the photographs in the gallery, except for one is made with the two and a quarter camera. So now I want you to look at that, those the, the um, shades and the details on the railing. Because what he did then, I was able to see that he was moving down the street. So basically he was documenting all the buildings. So like this is the building that we just saw. This is the next one. So this would be King Street. This is a one four by five image that's in the gallery. It's a very unique building. I actually started with this building to try and figure out where it was because it was such a large structure. 
I thought maybe we could figure out based on the um, Sanborn maps where it might have been located because it was a residential building. We were able to locate it and you'll see it on the map in the, in the gallery. But I was looking, because it's four by five, there's a lot of detail. You see that it says it OK Soda and Jane's. But I was looking at the curb and the people in the curb. That's what's really amazing about four by five images, a large format photography. There's so much detail that stays. And then because of this, I was able to see that that's the same curb from the other opposite end. And in fact, the woman in the middle is that woman. Different day, because she's wearing something different. This photograph is also in the gallery. And it, with, with a magnifying glass, you would be able to see at the very end of the street, Jane's store. So that's that same curve. And if you were to turn left at the end there, you would then reach the big house. So this same picture, you see that folly right here? That's also in this picture, which is this, this is the entire photograph that's in the gallery. Um, Keith, what's the name of the street? I'm spacing out. Keith, what's the name of the street? Come. Kamanu Wai Lane. Kamanu Wai Lane. Lane. This is also called a Tin Can Alley. You see the stair here, the staircase here. You see that guy? Here's a different view. This must have been made before this picture because he was just going up the stairs. Now, why am I obsessing about this? <laughs> oh, here's another one. So that's the next street over. Because just last week, I met this guy who's in the back there who drew me this map because he used to live here. So um, the Follies. So this is, the last picture is looking this way. There's Jane's store, who he knows as Mata's store. And he says that is the third lamppost. If you turn right, that's his house. This is Keith's house. His grand, no, grandma's house, uncle and auntie's house, and Sam's house. And he pointed out to us that this is Keith's great aunt, Tatsumi Ogawa. The little boy there that I didn't even notice that much. It's Fabian, Iguchi, and Sam. And then there are two cats. You see there's one here and one there. You know, being a photographer, I think that I was just obsessed with that hula hoop and I didn't pay attention to anything else. And I don't know what's wrong with me because this is the same group of people looking the other way. He thinks that they were sitting right there. Keith points out that they have communal bath. These are the stalls and this is the furo. There's a lot of kitchen uh, cooking and cleaning in the, in the courtyard area as well. Oh. And this is Fabian, high school graduation picture. Oh. <laughs> At opening night, um, we were also introduced to Alex Poel, who, who walked up to me and he says, this is my grandmother. He says, he lived in this house. And in fact, any time that you see that banister, you could tell the photograph was made in that house. And if I only knew I would have been able to identify more of the shots. This photograph you've seen before, the woman on the left is his aunt Piilani Punaheli. This guy is his, his uncle, Puna, um, Piilani's father, Robert. He doesn't remember the other people, that, but that's Manu paint, petting the dog. This is Alex's brother. 
this is Lonnie. He says he doesn't remember where he was that day. He remembers Abo Rosas. This was such a mysterious photograph for me. The knife, the fish, and then this kind of road runner type of half a cat. And then some, and a, a guy, I don't think that's Francis, reflected in the mirror back there. He looks like such an ominous, scary character. Right? He really doesn't look like other people. But when I was looking at the contact sheets, I found other pictures of Abo. And he doesn't look so scary here with his daughter, I think. So I think it's really important to look at more than one picture to see how pictures inform or mislead. The work of a curator is to um, make something out of something some th that other people had done. So I want to um, say just a little bit about my curatorial decisions. Francis Hart does not print full frame photographers. There are two versions of his work prints. I think that I made the right decision because <laughs> it seems that tongs is so important that it was cropped off here and it's much more expansive. This is the one in the show. In his contact sheet, he made four exposure of the same corner. Obviously, he tripped the shutter once when the truck was passing. And this is the one he ended up printing, which I think is, um, I would agree. But you see that he had cropped. I'm going to go back so you can see. It is um, printed as a horizontal and a vertical, and not as originally photographed as a square. He also had um, several versions. In fact, the whole roll of film of this particular scene. So both of these are available. At, uh, he made work prints from them. I think they were either 8 by 10 or 11 by 14. I chose this one because I thought that this, this gesture framed under the overhang was just so perfectly seen. It's unusual that Har made so many shots of the same scene. Uh, out of all the contact sheets, this is a very rare occasion. So he really thought that, he really wanted to work the scene. He must have been attracted to this half demolished wall. So we have about 12 contact sheets um, shown at the gallery. Um, I, for those of you who are photographers, um, or photo educators, I always tell, I always love to look at my students' contact sheets because you can learn about how people see and how they make decisions. It drives me crazy when my students put their, their negatives out of sequence so I can't figure out what they're seeing. So I encourage you to do that. Um, we, were, we did not put all his contact sheets in the show and we did it because we wanted to leave some for those of you who want to take advantage of the Hamilton collection while the show was, was on. So here's the folly picture. Look at how much he cropped. So this is the one he used. So the print is actually just maybe about 60%. He printed at much higher contrast. And deliberately, I think, bookend the image with um, the pinup girl poster and this female figure on the, on the left. Of course, there are many, many photographs that I did not, um, I was not able to include because there's for space or they were redundant or I didn't think it would fit. Um, here's an image, I think, and Keith can tell me whether I'm right. I think it's to the left of the big house. No, it's, it's on the right. It's, that's the bottom end of Koloa Lane. So if you go to Mata's store and you turn store, right. You get to the store, turn yeah. right. Okay. And oh, right, that's left, right. That's all the houses on the right, right. Um, and I think people were upset that I did not include this image of a bookstore. It's a really extraordinary image, but 
And I don't regret this because of the use of flash. I thought it was really out of character for the show. But it is a really great picture, just for what it's documents. So besides being a documentary photographer, I think that Har also had an experimental side. This image, out of all of them, I think is quite striking for its super high contrast and its graphic quality. So at the Hamilton Collection, there were a number of different versions of this. And I think it's um, really interesting to see. And maybe Michael will talk more about that particular lineage. Mm -hmm. No? Okay. Uh, so this is a um, reversal print. So I think what he did is he, he, is he made prints and then contact printed the print. And he has several versions of this. So he um, do this experimentation in the dark room. He would increasingly um, abstract the information. Another print that's in the show of a burnt out building. And you can see um, mountain range in the back. Might have been looking toward New Wanda Valley. He also did Sabatier, and so he did a reverse print and then did Sabatier, which is um, a re-exposure technique in the darkroom where, where it would kind of switch the um, highlights and the, and, the de and the shadows. So of course I couldn't include this because the show is really about documenting Aala, um, but these are such great images. This photograph, um, I think, of his wife, of I his wife Irene, when they were sunbathing, and put, she puts leave on her eyes. It's got a very surrealist quality to it, and I thought this was interesting because um, Barbara Kruger used this image, I think, without permission, as part of her series of re-photography. Re so I'm going to end my nerdiness here, um, except to say that because um, the area is so familiar to me and to see it 50 to 60 years later I think about all the photographers now how we can maybe imagine how the people not yet born will see our work so what how we might want to um, configure our images for them and how it might be different from just doing it for ourselves I will hand this to Micah There. Thank you so much. That was so um, amazing. And I, I was really excited to find out that um, the first show that I was inheriting, uh, coming arriving here as director, it was this Francis Haar exhibition. Um, and it's been an incredible experience. It's just been such a, a great show to work with. Uh, <laughs> These ducks. No, just kidding. <laughs> we'll, go, we'll go back to uh, When you think of Francis Haar, um, one of the first things that at least I thought of was that Barbara Kruger image, uh, because you can see um, in his appropriation, how do we go forward? Is it this? Uh, yeah. Uh, she's used it for a book cover um, in the past, and also this is the work itself, um, a red framed photograph that reappropriates uh, that appropriates his imagery. Um, but I guess instead of going down the route of thinking more about Francis Haar in particular, I realized that what made sense to me to talk about to an audience of, I guess today was about photographers, right, and kind of addressing photographers, was to think about the history of the documentation of urban spaces and how, I guess I would say, properly photographic that is. As, uh, as photography was announced uh, by Arago to the French public in 1839, it was not introduced as an art form, per se, but as a science and as a way of aiding in cartography and aiding in map making. And some of our earliest images, uh, you can see the Louis de Guerre photograph here, the Boulevard de Tempe, um, around 1838 are of the urban space of Paris in particular. This is, by the way, the first photograph where you have a person uh, because photography had just been invented and the exposures were so long that this busy street would have been uh, full of 
carts and horses and people, but because the exposure was long enough, the only person we have is this guy getting his shoes uh, shined. And, so, and he had no possibility of knowing that he would be preserved forever in this new medium of photography because it didn't exist yet. People didn't know about it because this was taken in 1838 by Daguerre who was testing out the medium and then gave it to Arago who was part of a, a scientific council to announce to the public in 1839. So it's this very interesting moment where you have a lot of the possibilities that we're talking about that Gay so beautifully pulled out of the Francis Har show, the, um, the nature of photography as an archive, as a repository of information, as something uh, where images and, and even figures can sit as if trapped in amber until we, some other future person who can't even be imagined yet by the person taking the image discovers it and wants to do something with it. Um, but immediately after the, the announcement of photography in 1839, obviously the daguerreotype was an enormously popular form. Everyone's heard of the daguerreotype. And uh, since it was announced to the public and kind of the recipe was given to the public at that time, thousands of people ran out and started daguerreotyping everything around them. And so you start to have this documentation of urban space. Uh, now, Daguerre sold the recipe to the French government to give to the people for a stipend, but he also did produce cameras with a patent that you could buy if you were a passionate daguerreotypist. And, uh, and, and so he had a couple of different channels of making money off of this, but essentially it was put out there for the public, and it was um, not an art you had to go to school for, not something you had to go to the academy to study. Uh, it was from th the beginning a middle class art, something you could take up if you had a little extra money and some spare time and wanted to uh, experiment. And actually photography benefited from that enormously. You might think of an op open source code, the way that if it's put out into the public and everyone has access to it and starts to um, fiddle around with it. So the recipe that Daguerre had produced was only so good but very quickly, all of these people refined that recipe and made better and better and better photographs. Um, and this coincided with, um, at least within the first decade or so of the announcement of photography, uh, something called the Hausmanization of Paris, which came about uh, partially as a way of modernizing the city. So uh, Napoleon said, oh, there are parts of Paris that, where the working class live that are um, centers of cholera, let's say. There are disease-ridden slums. We need to modernize. We need to create urban renewal, uh, which is part of why I bring this up, right? Because you can, I, I heard echoes of this in the Aala uh, urban renewal. Um, so hospitalization starts in Paris. Um, gosh, I have these in my notes, actually. Um, in, in Napoleon comes, the third comes into power in 1848. Um, in 1850, he starts to modernize Paris. So that's within 10 years of the announcement of photography. And uh, he says it's going to make everything more healthy and less congested. It's hard for traffic to get around and more grand. You can see the Grand Boulevard here. And you can see um, this is the kind of Paris that we know today. Uh, but it was also noteworthy that in the old Paris, uh, neighborhoods were known for um, taking up the cobblestones in these very narrow streets and creating blockades, which made it impossible for imperial troops to get through, uh, to break up pockets of, of resistance, political resistance. And so in a way, the idea of house minorization, this urban renewal program of the 1850s, was to fix political resistance by breaking up small communities who had historically leaned left. So it was also a political process. Um, and a lot of it was about breaking up neighborhoods by creating these large roads that would go straight through uh, certain portions. So again, these grand boulevards that we know. And photographers were there throughout the process uh, to photograph and document the old narrow streets and Gothic parts of Paris, which were under threat. Um, and which were transformed and which were changing. So you see here um, Marville, one of the great photographers of the old Paris, uh, photographing a number of small streets. And you can see, I guess, to a certain extent, this sort of this maybe they would have been smelly. This is like before sewage treatment. These probably would have been full of, at the very least, you know, horse pee. And uh, I think that's actually just 
horse dung all over these streets too. Um, the way it shines so beautifully in the collodion. Yeah, it doesn't work. Uh, but also, I think there is a sort of a, a, a beauty and a charm to these photographs that we've come to associate very much with um, a kind of nostalgic sense of Paris. But at the time was the very thing that was being, uh, you could say, attacked by the government. And the government was saying, this is what we need to clean up. This is what we need to get rid of. Look at that street. You know, nothing can get through there. We can't bring carts of groceries. We can't get vegetables through. Um, it's unclean. The, the city actually set up a commission to photograph these kinds of narrow streets. Oh, I wanted to show you also, uh, this is Marville photographing on salt paper. This is where I'm really dorky. So the salt paper print kind of comes after the daguerreotype as a, fl a more flexible medium. Um, you don't need to follow, this part isn't that important, but it's the first negative. So it's kind of important and exciting. Uh, but they would basically just rub oil on paper. So it wasn't a very good negative. So the pictures kind of looked fuzzy and romantic and um, it wasn't the greatest medium for documenting with precision and lucidity. And so it's really when we get to albumin silver prints on glass negatives or collodion uh, that we really get the kind of precise detail that we really, really love about uh, old photographs. Because these things are the big plate photos that are, that are huge and capture so much detail. Um, so in a way, their analog space, especially if they were around 8 by 11, um, these have a lot of information in them. So in that way that Gay was saying, oh, you can zoom in to the Haar images because they're two and a quarter. Uh, these you can just zoom in infinitely. They're, they're so rich with information, um, and we don't have that anymore. That's a kind of photography that we just don't, we, we haven't gone back to that level of information per plate, uh, if you will, especially with roll film and then going into the digital. Um, Marville also photographed the modernization of Paris, so you can see uh, what happened after the, the tiny streets were torn down. Uh, these exciting new technologies that were put out uh, to transform the city. So these are um, pissoirs, you know, uh, in common parlance. So this is part of that problem of having dark, stinky alleyways everywhere. These help at least men urinate in public, <laughs> which is part of the new city. There are so many millions of people living together in a compressed space. So what do you do? Well, you create this. So this is part of a new technology of how we live together in an urban space. Uh, sorry, that was going backwards. These are newspaper kiosks and surveillance bureaus where policemen can sit, right? So these are also parts of the new city that are getting built. Uh, and these technologies of surveillance, of the distribution of information, um, that go along with that sense of the modern city. Um, there's also a great deal of, and this is going back to the salted paper print, right? You can see this is slightly earlier, of the, the photographing of the old, and it's particularly the Gothic, which is under threat and being destroyed in this particular time period. And there was actually a government commission called the Mission Iliographique sent to photograph these monuments, not just in Paris, but all over France. And so we have these great images of uh, Gothic monuments during this time, during the 1850s, right when that idea of house modernization starts. So as the idea of urban renewal starts, you also have the simultaneous almost anxiety to document the spaces that are being destroyed. And these were not put on display in any kind of art context. They were sent back to the capital to a government bureau that accepted them and put them in portfolios and filed them away. And that was it. So in a way, they didn't quite know why they were photographing, but that's what an archive is, right? You just, you take the images, you put them away, and you say, maybe in the future, this will be important. We don't know what about this is important yet. Maybe an architect, maybe a historian, maybe someone will be curious about what was in that particular spot for some reason having to do with the legal dispute. But these, um, there's some very, very, very beautiful photographs from just the first basically decade of photography that have that precise mission of capturing and photographing the architectural details that are under threat. And again, it was hard to photograph people at that time. So architecture is pretty much a lot of what we have. Um, 
it's not entirely true, but it, there's a sort of whole separate category of, of portrait photography happening, um, as well as the destruction of spaces. So to me, the horror images very much uh, fit into a lineage uh, that goes back to the very heart of photography and its earliest uses, and even its kind of particular particularity as an art form that sits not totally comfortably in art as a category, but also in um, in science and in uh, documentation, and just that kind of rich, rich, rich sense of detail that you get with the photograph, that sense that it hasn't been through the hand at all, that it's a, a kind of actual record of light hitting a thing that was sitting in, in front of the camera at a particular moment in time, that ability of photography to create an archive. Um, and this is just a map of sort of where people from the Mission Heliographique were going, these different capitals, and they would go back to Paris. Um, probably don't need quite as much detail as I have gone into here. So I will just skip ahead. <laughs> but again, the, that richness and depth of detail is coming about um, simultaneously because the technology is getting us there, because we, the photography has been invented and the glass plate negative has been invented. Uh, so it's possible, but also because there is this anxiety somehow to capture change and to capture it for a future audience that isn't yet totally articulated. It's not, it's not an art audience. It's not a salon audience. It's not a private collector. Um, it's some viewer of the future that, uh, that hasn't even fully been imagined. It's almost like a, a kind of science fiction of an image because the image is being taken and stored away um, and who knows for who and who knows when it will be discovered. They're like time capsules. Baldu is incredible because he's really the photographer of the Louvre uh, of that work site and he took hundreds of large format photos of this construction process alone. So you've probably walked in, in that area. Oh, and so to, to bring this <laughs> into the 20th century, um, the key figure is uh, Eugène Atge, who towards the early part of the 20th century, so those were all photographers who, for the most part, worked for the state. And again, they were taking their images, some salt, salt uh, paper negative, but for the most part, collodion and sending them back to a government office. Atje started doing this for himself. He said, I'm going to make a record of the changing urban space around me for, well, for artists and for theater people and set designers and people who might want to use this kind of information. So again, it's not art, but he called them documents for artists. And so he photographed the Paris around him very much as his predecessors had, very much as Marville had, in fact. Um, and he wasn't a terribly successful businessman. He didn't have a huge audience for his pictures for artists, although we do know some painters use them. Um, but he tried to document the style of doors. He tried to document stairwells. Again, using that weird way that photography has of not quite being an art, but giving you tons and tons and tons of information. So, and each image is both incredibly specific and, and also kind of general. It's showing you an example of a thing. This is a, a kind of a, a flower shop. Um, he even did photograph people. Uh, there are some examples of that. And for the most part, he kept his archive in his own home. Um, and if you go there today, it'll, the plaque on the door says, Father of Modern Photography. Uh, he lived here from 1898 to 1927, and part of the reason he's considered the father of modern photography is because this photographer, Bernice Abbott, who was a, a, at least a generation younger, uh, was in Paris and was friends with the Surrealists, and they said, you've got to check out this guy. At Jay is incredible. He's really doing something that we consider surrealism. We think it's art, 
but he just says he's making documents. He says he's not an artist. He's, he's just this guy who photographs everything. And um, Abbott's, Abbott rescued Atje's collection and, and brought a huge amount of it to the Museum of Modern Art um, and curated a show around his work and was the key cura curatorial figure who uh, preserved his legacy for the present. And that, uh, that happened very much at the very end of his life and then after his death, not during his life itself. Um, and it happened because of the surrealists and because these artists thought his, his work, these living artists thought his work was really exciting for what they were doing. Um, she also took up his style, I would say, very much. So photographing urban spaces with, you know, it's not too arty. If you look at art photography of that time, it has its own kind of trajectory and it's very pretty. I should have brought in examples, but I thought, a different different subject but um, it's very fuzzy and moody and kind of competing with painting in in its stylized effects let's say uh, and these photographs are not like that um, and from Abbott we also get pretty fast to Walker Evans and his photographs of urban spaces and uh, and architecture as a that become a kind of commentary on urban life. I don't know if I'm going, th these are too many jumps, but this, this is, I would, I would say, the sort of essential trajectory of street photography um, as it arrives to us in the 20th century. Um, and it's very much an American lineage, which is weird because for the French, their idea of photography goes off in a totally different direction and picks other figures. but. In this country, for some reason, at least via the Museum of Modern Art, we have picked these figures as our lineage and our predecessors. Um, and then, and with a really strong emphasis on Evans. And then maybe after him, Robert Frank. But I think, for me, looking at the horror images, they're incredible and they're unique and specific qualities, but also very much how they how much they're a part of this larger project of the photographic documentation of urban space um, and how honored I feel to be part of that unimaginable at the time future. Uh, that kind of viewer who is, who doesn't exist when the photographs were taken but could see the archive in, in this present and who gets to participate in that history that way. Um, and that's how I feel every time I go into the show. And I'm, I'm so grateful that we have these images. Sorry, I'm just showing you more of these Walker Evans images. Um, but it's funny, when, when Gay was saying, oh, I think he was walking down the street and photographing every house along the way, um, I was really thinking about some of these. I think these photographs, you know, you could also say, To me, they, they are of a sort of continuous lineage. Um, I put in some Har ones. Wait, I'm trying to skip ahead. I think you could also say by the 60s, when Har was photographing, that something like Ed Ruscha's Every Building on the Sunset Strip, right, is very much a part of that project where uh, you're rejecting the artiness and the, uh, sing the sort of singular authorial presence and expressivity of the art form of photography and instead saying, hey, something photography does really well is seriality. Something it does really well is capturing detail. Something it does really well is being uh, a pseudo-objective eye uh, that can take in way more than the, than the pencil or the human hand ever could and give that image back to you. Um, so I think Ruscha's deadpans, I don't think Har is quite as deadpan as Ruscha, you know, mind you, but, but I think this is part of a, a a, a kind of a use of photography. Um, these are, of course, uh, Burned and Hilla Becker's uh, famous buildings uh, starting in the 70s. These are the water towers. Do I have more Becker's? I think that might be it. Um, but sort of one thing after another composition, uh, a, a clear purpose within the series. And, and I'd say this, is the, this, this show is the group of work within Har that's probably the most like that. Um, but then if you think about it, he also does do these other series, like Artists of Honolulu, right? So there are these ways in which 
Kara is thinking in, in, I don't know, the series is a great form for a pho photographer. And I think a lot of what we can celebrate within the show is the unique way that photography is not quite like other art forms. It's not quite like a, a print show or a painting show or a sculpture show. Um, it has its own logics and its own particularities and its own strengths um, and its own weird uh, excesses, um, particularly of information that, that we can fall into. So that was the dorkiness that I wanted to share <laughs> with you <laughs> today. Because um, it's what I see as, a, as an art historian when I go in and, and look at the show, um, along with so many people, which has been so great and so rewarding, and uh, so many people with different takes on the show and their own stories. Um, I think that might be my, my end.